They say necessity is the mother of invention, and nothing is more necessary or desperate than your nation's very survival in a time of war. And World War II was the worst war in human history, with over 80 million people killed and entire countries bombed and burned to the ground. With their survival and even their very existence at stake, many countries came up with all sorts of wild and crazy weapons born out of a combination of ingenuity and sheer desperation. Here then are the six craziest weapons of World War II. Number six, Nazi underwater tanks. In the summer of 1940, Hitler's vast armies had conquered Europe and stood ready to invade England in an operation called Sea Lion. There was a problem though. To get to England, the Germans first had to cross the English Channel, which was defended by the British Royal Navy which was at the time the most powerful navy in the world. For the German armies, crossing the English Channel would mean running a deadly gauntlet of Royal Navy warships supported in the air by the Royal Air Force's fighters and bombers. So the Germans came up with a crazy idea. To just avoid completely the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, why not just have their tanks drive along the bottom of the English Channel? That way, the tanks wouldn't even have to deal with British ships and planes. And so, in preparation for the Sea Lion invasion, the Germans began converting their regular Panzer tanks into underwater Panzers or U-Panzers. These U-Panzers were ordinary Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks that were made watertight by sealing all their ports, their hatches, and their air intakes with tape, also with caulking and rubber coverings. Since the tank crews needed air to breathe, and the tank's engines needed oxygen to run, each tank was fitted with a long rubber hose attached to a float that bobbed on the surface of the water and brought air down to the u Panzer's engine and crew. Unfortunately for the Germans, but very fortunately for the residents of Britain, German testing of the u Panzer showed they were very, very, very unreliable weapons. With all their hatches and viewports sealed, the tank crews could not see outside the tank and so had no idea where the hell they were actually going. The initial idea was to steer the tank in the general direction of the enemy's beaches, but since tank crews couldn't see outside the tank, the u Panzers had a disturbing tendency to get stuck on large rocks and other underwater obstacles. The tanks also had a bad habit of sinking into the seabed and an even worse habit of leaking water inside the tank which ended up quickly killing the entire crew. Operation Sea Lion was eventually cancelled by Hitler, who decided to try his luck with invading Russia, and the Upanzers were never actually used in combat. Number 5. Flying Aircraft Carriers When you think of flying aircraft carriers, the first thing that probably comes to mind is the Avengers Helicarrier. But believe it or not, the United States actually experimented with real-life flying aircraft carriers just before the start of World War II. This is the USS Akron, which was built for the United States Navy and launched in September of 1931. The Akron, at 785 feet or 240 meters in length, was one of the largest flying objects ever built. Just for comparison, a modern Boeing 747 is only a third of that length, at 250 feet or 76 meters. The Akron carried five Sparrowhawk fighter planes, which could be used to scout for enemy warships and to attack them. The Akron participated in 73 test flights, one of which was a naval exercise that had the airship traveling more than 3,000 miles or 4,800 kilometers while successfully scouting for enemy surface warships. Although the flying aircraft carrier was considered a limited success, U.S. Navy admirals just couldn't wrap their heads around how to fit this flying aircraft carrier into their plain old boring surface naval tactics. And then on April 4th, 1933, the Akron got caught in a thunderstorm off the east coast of the United States. The big bulky warship was battered and torn apart by high winds and went crashing down into the waters of the Atlantic. Of the 76 crewmen aboard the Akron, only three survived. To add insult to injury, 
a Navy scouting blimp that was said to search for the survivors of the Akron also crashed, killing two of its three crewmen. The Akron had a sister ship, the USS Macon. Like the Akron, the Macon participated in a number of mostly successful scouting exercises and missions. Unfortunately, also like the Akron, the Macon met with an untimely death in a storm. While flying off the coast of California on February 12, 1935, the Macon encountered heavy winds which severely damaged the airship and sent it crashing into the waters of the Pacific. Two years after that, the Hindenburg crashed in New Jersey, and after all these airship disasters, it turned out not so many people had any more interest left in airships at all. Number 4. Japan Submarine Aircraft Carriers While America's airship aircraft carriers didn't last long enough to see action in World War II, the Japanese had another, very different, but equally crazy idea for aircraft carriers of their own. The Imperial Japanese Navy had several regular, plain, old, boring surface aircraft carriers. The problem with these carriers, though, was that they were very vulnerable to being spotted and attacked by aircraft from the air. So the Japanese Navy had a brilliant idea. What if they took their aircraft carriers and just put them somewhere where the enemy couldn't even see them? Like under the water. You were looking at the Japanese Type I-400 submarine also known by the Japanese Navy as the Special Submarine. And special it was. At 400 feet, or 122 meters, it was by far the biggest type of submarine built during World War II, and would in fact remain so until the first ballistic missile submarines were launched in the 1960s. Each I-400 submarine carried three Aichi M6A bombers, and had the range to transport these aircraft from Japan all the way to either coast of the United States. These giant submarines were the brainchild of Admiral Izoroko Yamamoto, the commander-in-chief of the Japanese Navy. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto wanted to bring the war right to the American mainland. But he knew that after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy was alert and awake to the possibility of Japan's surface carriers making their way to America's west coast. So Yamamoto ordered the construction of 18 gigantic I-400 submarines. His idea was that these subs would be able to make their way across the Pacific completely undetected and launch their bombers using onboard catapults. The bombers would then fly to and attack western American cities like Los Angeles and San Diego. And there would be nothing that the Americans could do to stop them. Unfortunately, designing and building a submarine of this size proved far more difficult than Admiral Yamamoto had imagined. In the end, each sub proved capable of only carrying three aircraft, each one of which only carried a single bomb. So the overall strike capability of each I-400 submarine was very, very limited, since each one of these very big and very expensive submarines could drop just three bombs on a single target. Now at that time, Japan's resources were tied up with the little matter of, you know, actually fighting World War II, so only three of these very big and very expensive submarines were ever actually built, and the war was over well before Japan had a chance to use even a single one of them. Number 3. The Soviet Flying Tank The Eastern Front of World War II saw some of the biggest and most incredible tank battles in history. The Soviets were faced with the unenviable task of moving their big, heavy tanks across their huge country to stop the German invaders. Now, tanks happen to be very big and very slow and take a very long time to get to wherever the hell they're going. So the Soviets came up with a truly bizarre solution to this problem, namely the flying tank. The Soviets took their standard issue T-60 tank, slapped some wings and a tail onto it, and called it the Antonov A-40. This flying tank 
was actually more like a glider that could be towed by a larger aircraft to the battlefield, where the tank would detach from its tow rope and glide down to the ground with the crew already inside and ready and waiting to do battle with the Nazis. Except there was a little problem, or rather, a very big problem, namely the tank itself. Because tanks are very big, which means that the words flying and tank should never ever be used in the same sentence. Because, let's face it, tanks were never meant to fly. So even though the Antonov A-40 was a relative light tank, it was still too heavy for even the biggest and most powerful Soviet aircraft to tow effectively. And so this flying tank project was abandoned after only a single badly failed test. Number two, the German Maus super heavy tank. Although the Nazis started World War II with relatively small and not particularly powerful tanks. As the war went on, their tanks got bigger and bigger and bigger still. After all, the bigger the tank, the more armor it had, and the bigger the gun it carried. So if a big tank was good, and a bigger tank was even better, then, the Germans reasoned, why not build an unbelievably huge I can't believe it's really this gigantic, super ultra heavy tank. This is the Panzer Kampfwagen 8 Maus, a 188 ton super tank with a massive 128 millimeter main gun that could punch holes in enemy tanks more than two miles or three kilometers away while its super thick armor made it almost completely impervious to enemy fire. To put this behemoth into perspective, the German Tiger I, one of the biggest and most powerful tanks of World War II, weighed only 60 tons, while even the modern M1 Abrams, one of the heaviest tanks ever built, weighs in at a relatively modest 68 tons. And its massive weight proved to be the mouse's fatal flaw. Its sheer size and incredible weight meant that even the most powerful engines of that time could propel it at a speed of only 6 miles, or 13 kilometers an hour. As if that wasn't bad enough, the tank's weight made it unable to cross most bridges, thereby rendering it completely useless as a weapon. And so the Nazis learned that bigger isn't always necessarily better. Only two of these monstrous tanks were ever built, and not a single one ever saw combat. Number 1. Stalin's Suicide Dogs Let's face it, Joseph Stalin was not known as a very nice man. In fact, he was best known for brutally killing millions of people, whether it was by shooting, torture, starvation, or just being worked to death in the brutal Soviet gulags. So to this very long list of shitty things that Stalin has done, we can now add forcing dogs to pointlessly kill themselves in the name of the motherland. In 1941, the Soviet Union was faced with a seemingly unstoppable invasion by Nazi Germany. And so the Soviet Union created not just the craziest, but possibly the most bizarre and definitely the saddest weapon ever. The anti-tank suicide dog. The Soviet army took dogs and starved them for days, then trained them to search for food on the underside of tanks. Thus, these unfortunate little doggies were led to believe that the undersides of tanks were just loaded with yummy, yummy food. So after starving these dogs some more, the Soviets would then release them onto the battlefield, where presumably the desperately starving dogs would make a beeline for the undersides of German tanks, where the poor dogs expected to find food. At which point an explosive pack strapped to the dog's bag would blow up, crippling the enemy tank, and then fortunately killing the luckless dog in the process. The Soviets hoped to fill the battlefield with thousands and thousands of these unwitting suicide bomber dogs, thereby crippling the German army and stopping it in its tracks. 
Unfortunately for the Soviets, their plan didn't quite work out as they expected. The noise and confusion of a real-life battlefield proved way too much for the poor, terrified, starving dogs to deal with. Some of the dogs were confused and ran right back to their own lines, killing several of their own soldiers in the process. Even worse, the training process had accustomed the dogs to the shape and scent of the Soviet Army's own tanks. The German tanks had a different shape than the Soviet tanks and used a different fuel which made their scent completely unfamiliar to the Russian dogs. So naturally, the suicide dogs ran right back to the familiar sights and scents of the Soviet tanks on which they'd been trained, blowing up several of their own tanks in the process. As if that wasn't bad enough, the Germans quickly learned about the suicide dogs and began preemptively shooting every single dog they saw on the battlefield on site, which quickly rendered the whole suicide dog program pointless and moot. So those were the six craziest weapons of World War II. Let us know what you think in the comments and hit like and subscribe to get more of our videos.